gentle and of course very modern apes i wanted to make a quick video discussing some really cool news that came out of paleo twitter the other day and it has to do with a new fossil gibbon that just dropped gibbons or hylobatids are a member of the hominoidea superfamily and we share this superfamily with them they separate from the apes at the family level becoming hylobatidae to our hominidae and unlike hominidae their fossil record is very, very poor. Part of the reason this is thought to be is because gibbons live in rainforests, and rainforests, especially over in Southeast Asia, are known for having particularly acidic soil that is excellent when it comes to destroying fossils. Prior to this find that we're going to be talking about today, the oldest fossil hylobatid that is like for sure a hylobatid was Bunopithecus, which is known from the Middle Pleistocene. The Middle Pleistocene lasted from like roughly 130,000 years ago to like 770,000 years ago. Now, according to the molecular clock, the split between hominids and hylobatids occurred somewhere between 17 and 22 million years ago. So we've got a little bit of ground to make up with regard to our fossil hylobatids. But this find fills in a massive gap there, and I'd like to talk about it. First, let's talk a little bit about hylobatids and how they differ from the great apes, which I think is a horrible name, a horrible distinction to make because gibbons or hylobatids in general are quite great on their own. Hylobatids, generally speaking, are much smaller than the great apes, the hominids. In addition to this, their social systems differ dramatically. These guys tend to pair bond, that is to say they live in little monogamous couples, and sometimes these couples last for the entire lifetime of sort of both members of this duo. The cool thing about these guys too is they put a massive emphasis on vocal communication with one another and with uh, a sur surrounding sort of adjacent territory. So every morning, lots of different gibbon species, hylobatids, wake up and they go to the tippy tippy top of the trees in their territory, the male and the female, and they sing a duet together that is quite beautiful but really serves to say F off anybody who's planning on coming into our zone because this is our place just for us and our little family. The other interesting thing about hylobatids is that males and females are both highly intrasexually aggressive. That is to say, males will beat the crap out of interloping males and females will beat the crap out of interloping females. This is thought to be the selective pressure behind the massive canine teeth of both males and females. That is to say, Gibbons or hylobatids are sexually monomorphic. Males and females are approximately the same size and have, they have the same size, massive scimitar-like canine teeth. This is pretty rare for apes as apes tend to be at least a little bit sexually dimorphic. In humans, males tend to be anywhere from seven to 11% larger than females in skeletal stature and significantly more when it comes to things like overall weight or lean muscle mass. In chimpanzees, males tend to be about 30% larger than females. Same thing with bonobos, maybe a bit less. And in gorillas and orangutans, sort of our, our polygynous great apes and uh, solitary great apes, if we're talking about orangs, although solitary is kind of a catch-all term that isn't necessarily applicable to all orang groups and subspecies, they are extremely sexually dimorphic, with males being twice the size of females and having significantly larger canine teeth. But gibbons are the monomorphic ape, which is really interesting. And they, of course, have uh, a very interesting and familiar social system to us as humans because we, too, are a pair bonding ape. Physically, gibbons also have a very different intermembral index when compared to the other apes. While all apes, except for humans and our relatives in the fossil record, tend to have longer arms than legs. Humans, of course, have longer legs than arms because of our bipedality, as do many of the fossil hominins. Gibbons have longer arms than legs to an extreme degree. When you see the skeletal system of these guys, they kind of look like a creepypasta character because of how long their arms are. And this is because they are expert brachiators and they are the only extant apes that use brachiation as their primary means of locomotion. That's that sort of hand over hand swinging through the trees and they can go fast. 
These guys can brachiate at speeds of 35 miles per hour and bridge like 50, 60 foot gaps between where they take off and sort of land when they're leaping through the trees, which is just incredible to think about. And of course their morphology is very adapted for this. They have these long hooked hands with kind of reduced thumbs as compared to other apes that perhaps engage in suspensory, careful clamoring, or even the precision grip and tool manipulation that humans and chimpanzees do. All this to say, it's really awesome that we've got another link in the sort of hylobatid evolutionary tree. And as I hope to show you in a minute, there's one particular thing that I think is very cool about this find, not just where it's located temporally, but it has to do with the teeth. So let's talk a little bit about this paper and Yuan Maupithecus. Unfortunately, these days I have to be a lot more careful with regard to making certain that the papers that I talk about on this channel and show on screen are open access, because if I'm showing them to you through my institution, you can get into some interesting, difficult copyright problems. It's not necessarily illegal, but I'm kind of just playing it safe these days as the channel continues to grow and I gain more enemies. So this is the paper, the earliest hylobatid from the late Miocene in China. So already you should see that late Miocene and think to yourself, oh my gosh, this is old. This is an old gibbon. The late Miocene, you know, it, it's sort of later end of that is like 4.4 million years, or maybe a little more like 5 million years ago with Artipithecus cadaver. But they actually put this thing as 7 to 8 million years ago, which is a far cry from 770,000 years, the maximum for Bunopithecus. So let's read the abstract and I can show you some of the pictures from this thing and we can talk about the implications of the finding, but we can't go through the entire paper because it isn't open access yet. Yuan Mopithecus Zhao Yuan, a small catarine from the late Miocene of Yunnan in southern China, was initially suggested to be related to the Miocene proconsuloids or the dendropithecoids from East Africa, but subsequent reports indicated it might be more closely related to hylobatids. So this thing was at least known of for a little while, and they were kind of like, man, we don't really have enough to say that this is or isn't a hylobatid. The same problem has come up again and again and again with these early catarines, or I guess later catarines, but potentially early apes from East Africa. Things like Dendropithecus, Limnopithecus, Rungopithecus, a lot of the material that I saw in Kenya this summer, and they have monomorphic canines, They're close to monomorphic. Some of them totally monomorphic, some a little bit less so, but these are given characteristics. So for a while, people were toying around with the idea that like maybe these things evolved in East Africa. This puts quite a monkey wrench into that. Here, a detailed comparison of the material, including seven newly discovered teeth and a partial lower face or maxilla of a juvenile individual provide crucial evidence to help establish its phylogenetic relationships. Yon Mopithecus exhibits a suite of synapomorphies that support a close phylogenetic relationship with extant hylobatids. So it has a trait that it shares with the descendants, the living hylobatids given cymex today. Furthermore, based on the retention of several primitive characteristics of the dentition, Yuan Mopithecus can be shown to be the sister taxon of crown hylobatids. So typically with fossils, we don't tend to get so confident as to say if something is directly in the line is a crown you know, member of the group. But stem is not bad. Sister is not bad. That suggests that you know, the ancestor of these hylobatids was also living contemporaneously. It just might not be Yuan Mopithecus specifically. The contention that copy Ranma Garensis, Ranma Garensis, Ron, not Garensis, okay, got it, from the middle Miocene of India might represent an earlier species of halobatid is not supported here. Instead, copy is inferred to be a specialized pliopithecoid more closely related to Krishnapithecus, Krishnai, from the late Miocene in India. Currently then, Yuan Mopithecus represents the earliest known definitively identified halobatid and the only member of the clade predating the Pleistocene. It extends the fossil record of hylobatids back to seven to eight million years ago and fills a critical gap in the evolutionary history of hominoids that has up until now remained elusive. Even so, molecular estimates for a divergent state of hylobatids from other hominoids, so this is gonna be extant, the hominids, us, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, um, is about 17 to 22 million years. So there's still a pretty big gap. We have to go from eight to 22 at some point here, but still, this is big as far as giving us clues as to the where and when certain hylobatid traits actually emerged, which is neat. So I want to talk for a minute about like what they actually found. This is the face of this thing, the little maxilla. There's not much to it, but in addition to this at the same site, they found several isolated teeth. 
And from these isolated teeth, we have five canines. This is very important because whenever you find canine teeth, you can at least get a decent estimate of sexual dimorphism as long as you have enough canines. Five just barely misses that statistically significant, we know for sure we've got, or not for sure, but we have a very high likelihood that both sexes are represented, but it is really close. And from this, we can look at these canines and see, and I will provide a link to the paper, and if you want to visit some kind of science hub to see for yourself, that of the canines that we have, they're all tall, sharp, scimitar-like canines, which suggests that we are looking at a monomorphic gibbon living seven to eight million years ago, sexually monomorphic gibbon. Now, this is a, you know, this is a truth, right? That we've got these monomorphic canines and here is sort of my speculation. Here is my extrapolation on that. Almost always, but again, not always, monomorphic primates have a social system that is characterized by pair bonding. This is the truth for marmosets and tamarins, although tamarins are, <laughs> Tamarins can be kind of mean. They, they almost do the polyandry thing where it's one female and multiple males. But the point being non-polygamy, non-general polygyny, it kind of suggests that perhaps the gibbons were engaging in this very specialized social system early on. Now, I study sexual dimorphism in extance, and it's long been at least my thought that in living hominids, we see fluctuations occur at least fairly easily in the canine teeth size and thus the sexual dimorphism or lack thereof. This is pretty evident when we look at the hominins because Artipithecus ramidus is a hominin that lived 4.4 million years ago and is sexually monomorphic. Males and females are approximately the same size and have approximately the same size canine teeth. But the Australopiths, which come very shortly afterwards, are dimorphic in body size. Males are significantly larger than females. That's the consensus I hold to. Anyway, some people argue that they might have been less dimorphic than that, but I don't know that you can make that case. But their canines are monomorphic. So it seems as though once the canines reach sort of a reduction in size, for whatever reason that may be, it's sort of a, a characteristic of hominins in general. Reducing the canines is one of the first things that's happened, first things that happens. We see it in Sahelanthropus and we see it in every single other hominin after that until they're finally little tiny stubby canines in, in our own species today. But once they shrink, they don't get big again. Body size continues to fluctuate all through hominin evolution, but the canines get small and they never get big again. I wonder if something similar didn't happen in the large canines that we see in the hylobatids. Again, that's purely speculation. All we really know now is that it seems as though we for certain have a hylobatid living seven, eight million years ago, and it seems like it's probably going to turn out as a sexually monomorphic species with regard to canine tooth size and thus body size. And I gotta say, I find it very romantic to imagine gibbon couples, approximately the same size, maybe differing in their pelage or their coat color, sitting together in these little pairs eight million years ago in what is now Yunnan, China, and, you know, just living their lives, hanging out, making their little families. And how, how interesting it must have been, how big the world must have seemed to them back then. How incredible. I look forward to finding more from Yuan Malpithecus. I hope we find more stuff from it. I hope we find even older gibbons because it, it would be very interesting if kind of what drives that split uh, from the sort of Southeast Asian or in generally the, the continental Asian primates, because we've got this, this orang or pongin split with the orangutans and Lufungpithecus and all these, you know, big, highly dimorphic, um, large bodied apes. And then we've got the small apes, which are monomorphic and little and quick and agile. It's almost like we've got this, you know, specialization here. Why? Why did that happen? And, and I hope we'll continue to find out more about it. It's interesting. So I just thought I would drop that on you because I've been thinking about it like crazy. Someone should draw these gibbons. Anyways, until next time, my gentle, of course, very modern apes, please do take care of yourselves.